All right. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for, for coming to today's Donuts and Diversity session, the uh, S and HSI, serving our students. Um, on behalf of the Rawls Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, um, I'm Kirsten Cook. My co-director is Andrea Romai, and um, we're so thrilled that, that you're here. Um, when you call something Donuts and Diversity, but you move it online and you take away the donuts, you never know how many people will show up just for the diversity. So um, I'm thrilled that we have uh, so many folks joining us here today. Um, I, I had the pleasure of attending the panel discussion that Corey Powell moderated two weeks ago during Texas Tech's HSI week entitled, um, What Does Servingness Mean in a Hispanic Serving Institution? And so the goal of today's session is to piggyback from, from that panel and to discuss programs and services that are available to our students um, here at Texas Tech. So while we're hosting this session during Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month, um, the programs and services that we'll discuss today are widely available on our campus. So today's session is gonna be part tabling event and part panel discussion with plenty of time for Q&A. So please have your questions um, ready to go. And with that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's session, um, Jade Silva Tovar. Jade is the Senior Director in Texas Tech's Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She has earned a Bachelor of Art in Spanish from the University of Iowa, a Master of Education in Higher and Post-Secondary Education from Arizona State, and currently is pursuing her PhD in Higher Education Leadership from Colorado State. So with that, Jade, please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Cook mentioned, I'm Jade Silva Tovar, and I have the pleasure of moderating this panel. So I do I get to do little talking, um, which is wonderful. So I'm joined um, with some amazing colleagues. Again, I'm a little bit biased because some of them are colleagues in our division and others that I've worked with across um, the things that we're doing at the institution. So I'm excited to hear from everyone. Uh, this afternoon, um, we'll go ahead and I'll get started um, just to having folks introduce themselves. And then what we'll do is we'll have each unit, um, I'll call upon each of our panelists to talk a little bit about their unit, their department, the history at Texas Tech, um, being able to give um, their perspective, what brought them to Tech. Not everybody is necessarily um, a graduate of Tech. And then um, how Rawls and the institution as faculty and staff can support each of the programs and units. So um, to get us started, I will call on Dr. Lindsay Boynton with our TRIO Student Support Services. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Lindsay Boynton and I'm the director for TRIO Student Support Services, which is a federal grant for first generation and income eligible students on campus. We're currently in our second uh, grant cycle, so year two of that, um, and definitely have enjoyed it. I, I started with this position in January, right in the middle of the pandemic, um, but has definitely been a lot of fun um, to get to know the students, and we provide them with the services, um, various kinds of services for academic success through tutoring, but also graduate school um, preparation visits, um, career success, any of the things that um, they might need where um, we're there to provide or to refer them to somebody on campus that could help them. And I think um, to answer the question about how the Rawls College of Business could support us is um, you know, events like this where we learn about resources that are available, understanding what they are and what they provide so that um, we can get good referrals, students can know what's available to them so they can take advantage of it. I think a lot of times the name TRIO doesn't necessarily equate to what that program is. So the more people on campus that know what it is, the more benefit that that's going to be for our students. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Dr. John Kreider, you can introduce yourself and your program. Yeah, thank you, Jade. And uh, thank you, Dr. Cook, for inviting us. This is a great opportunity. I, I enjoy the donuts and diversity. I, I am one of those that's greatly missing the donuts right now. It's three o'clock on, you know, on, a, on a Tuesday. We could, we could use some sugar. Um, so I am the director of the McNair Scholars Program. So the McNair Scholars Program is also a TRIO grant um, through the Department of Education um, uh, at, in the United States here. 
And so um, our goal is a little bit different than, than Dr. Boynton's program is ours is to provide basically to help students, um, particularly first gen low income and um, historically excluded students from, from graduate school um, to, to help them be able to do research and then go on and get a doctorate. So um, many of our, we serve um, roughly about between 25 and 30 students every year and they will get um, a faculty, be assigned a faculty member or they'll choose a faculty member in, a, in an independent project. They do that during the first year of our program. And then the second year of our program, um, we help them apply and move on to, to graduate school. And so we have, um, we are currently in our fifth year here at Texas Tech. But for folks who have been around a while, the name should be somewhat familiar. We were here from roughly 1997 to 2008. Unfortunately, in 2008, the Department of Education um, cut the McNair funding by about a third and about 50 programs across the nation were defunded. And we happen to be just part of that. Um, but we're back and we're in the process of rewriting the grant. And hopefully we'll, um, that'll be due later on in the winter. Um, one thing, you know, working with Rawls, I've had a couple of students who have worked with Rawls and faculty members and, and have gone on to graduate school or and have done research um, in a number of ways. Um, and so really the way we want to partner is just if you have those students that are moving to move beyond an undergrad, they're willing to go to grad school and are interested in some type of research, send them our way um, and we can get them connected and either they'll be eligible for the McNair Scholars Program or we can connect them to other pro resources on campus so that they can do, the, do that research as well as um, prepare for graduate school. Thank you, Dr. Kreider. Uh, Brandon Cruz. Hello, everyone. It's so great to see you all virtually today. My name is Brandon Cruz, and I serve as director for our transition and mentoring programs. But today I am representing specifically our first generation transition and mentoring programs. Uh, the first gen transition and mentoring program has been around for over 10 years under a variety of different names. And so um, as it stands today, FGTMP serves students, faculty, and staff in a couple of ways. And so the first way is through peer mentorship. And so we have a first-gen peer mentorship program that connects undergraduate students to upper-level first-generation um, students and matches them based on academic pathway, interest, and or um, professional goals. In addition to that, we also provide supplementary student success activities. Um, a couple of the highlighted experiences that my colleague Shruti has developed um, is the Let's Talk About series. And so this series really connects students, faculty and staff to the intersection of being first gen and something else. And so we talk about being first generation and dreamers, being first generation Latinx and kind of how those two identities um, culminate and, and how students live their college experience through that. In addition to that, we also host university-wide initiatives that we partner across campus with faculty and staff to put on, including our first gen week, which is going to go live November 8th through the 12th, um, that Shruti, among others, are working diligently on building programming for our First Gen Champions Institute, which is November 12th. And that is open to faculty, staff, and graduate students to engage in a day long experience for learning how to support our dynamic and diverse student community of first generation um, students. And then in the spring, our First Gen Champions Institute. And so my takeaways for you all um, tuning in today is, Refer your first generation students to us. You are working with them. We serve 25% first generation students here at Tech. So there's a likelihood you are connecting with them. Um, in addition to that, be part of the different activities that we um, host during first gen week next month and consider submitting a proposal for our first gen champions institute because in addition to learning you are also experts and you can provide um, new information to the ongoing research for this activity next month thank you brandon esther Um, hi, so my name is Esther De Leon. I am an associate librarian um, here in the main campus. Um, and so my group that I'm representing today is the Chicana X Latinx Working Group. Uh, 
This is a brainchild of my co-PI, Corina Alvarado. She's a PhD candidate and a part-time instructor here at Tech. The idea came about after an unsuccessful attempt at a, a reading series on Chicano feminisms. And seeing, has, seeing as how we are a Hispanic serving institute, she felt it critical to include critical perspectives of feminisms and feminism thought, especially within the realm of Chicana and Latina perspectives. Uh, she asked if I would be interested in, in uh, partnering with her because she needed a faculty to get this working group going. And I said, yes. Um, and so we are funded through a grant uh, provided by the Humanity Center. And the group began meeting in the fall of 2019. And we meet monthly for approximately two to three hours discussing a range of topics related to, but not limited to Chicana Latina feminism. And then we have a built in hour where um, students, faculty and staff can work or write or what, whatever they make of the time. Um, so um, some of the things that we do provide is, it's more of an infinity group. Uh, we do, we do focus on Chicana feminisms, feminisms, but I, I kind of like the fact that I can provide the space for other Chicanas and Latinas on campus. Uh, we're not exclusive to Chicanas and Latinas, but um, it's a space that they can utilize uh, again for support, for peer mentoring, for whatever they want to make out of uh, again of the group and the time. Thank you, Corey Hamilton. Hey, everybody. Uh, really glad to be here this afternoon. Uh, I get uh, the unique experience of getting to share a couple of different things with you um, at the moment. Uh, the first I'll share with you uh, is about our Raider Education Department. So as the director of Raider Education, uh, we've been around um, for about a year and a half now. This is our second full academic year uh, that we've been in place. And this year has been a really a focus for us on moving from um, facilitated conversations and workshops um, to peer facilitated uh, conversations and workshops uh, for student organizations, for student staff teams, as well as for student and um, uh, for staff and faculty as well. So um, Raider Education is uh, founded on the premise that we want to make sure that we are providing opportunities for cultural intelligence, skill development, and leadership development for our student body, um, providing, you know, some ethical leadership development and values-based leadership. And so uh, we do that by focusing on um, specific topics around understanding culture, um, recognizing identities, um, anti-racism and allyship, uh, and lots of other topics as well. Um, and we do that by uh, working with you. Uh, so we sit down with student organizations as well as staff teams and talk about, you know, which of these topics would be meaningful for you to, uh, to better understand and how can we come into your space uh, and lead a conversation to help others do inclusive leadership better. Um, so Raider Education, you can actually sign up on our website uh, to get a consultation about a workshop or, or conversation, or you can reach out to me um, and we can talk about uh, whether you'd like something that's peer, ed peer facilitated or um, a conversation, a training, uh, lots and lots of different options. So we're excited uh, that that program continues to grow. I also get to share with you um, about uh, uh, another program, uh, which I am currently uh, the interim director for. Uh, we are currently searching for a director for our Intercultural um, Education and Engagement Office, which oversees our Cultural Heritage Month events, as well as our Student Intersectional Leadership Council. So if you check out the website, um, you can see that um, the Student Intersectional Leadership Council and our Heritage Months are going on throughout the academic year, from Latinx Heritage Month, which this um, is, a part, uh, is a part of, um, to our Indigenous Peoples Heritage Month, uh, APIDA, uh, Heritage Month, Women's History Month, uh, uh, Black History Month. Um, we're active throughout the year, putting on cultural events, uh, celebrations, um, and all kinds of opportunities for faculty, staff, and students to get involved um, in cultural experiences. And uh, SILK, the Student Intersectional Leadership Council, has been around for a little over two years now. And uh, SILK is a group of students who actually represent um, and speak out on behalf of seven different marginalized and minoritized communities on campus. Um, and so as an HSI, one of those communities is uh, Latinx students. And so um, 
we have representatives for each of the seven categories as well as an executive board. Um, and they work to advocate for students. So they reach out to different student groups to find out you know, how, um, how we can be supportive of um, the events and activities that they're a part of, or also things um, as issues arise on campus uh, for student groups, um, how we can help to advocate uh, for resources or getting the word out um, and also providing opportunities for activism uh, and engagement uh, for students. So if you know of any students that are um, active in that way and would be interested in using their voice and their talents um, to advocate for others on campus and to get involved uh, in really being able to create some social change and movement on campus, um, Silk might be a great place for them to um, you know, add something great to their resume, but also be able to practice that leadership development and, um, uh, and really make a difference here on campus. Thank you, Corey. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Miguel Levario. Hello, thank you, Jade. I'm sorry I'm outside and I hope the wind isn't too bad. If it is, please let me know. I'll try to figure it out. Um, yes, my name is Dr. Miguel Levario. I apologize for having my camera off. As many of you are familiar, doing parent duties, I'm trying to pick up my daughter from school. Uh, made the mistake of walking, so I guess that's what I'm trying to do. But anyway, to make a long story short, I'm the program coordinator for the Me Mexican American Latino Latino Studies minor. Uh, we started uh, offering courses in the spring of 2019, and we've been offering courses ever since. We are an, an 18-hour interdisciplinary minor. We have cross-listed classes in College of Human Sciences, um, Media and Communications, of course, Arts and Sciences. So we try to expand as much as possible to the entire university. We are currently in transition into the College of Arts and Sciences. Right now we are housed under university studies and they've been phenomenal. Um, but we just feel that it's a better fit for us to move in arts and sciences due to the fact that we want to offer the majority of face-to-face -face courses so that our students not only are able to take our classes, but there's a process of potential uh, opportunity for them to also seek out Latino, Latina uh, mentors in our faculty. Um, right now, I'm also a member of a working group that is establishing an Institute for Latina, Latino Studies that we hope that will go on, go live next fall. Uh, it'll consist of two centers, the Center for Mexican American Latina Latino Studies and the Center for Latin American and Iberian Studies. So that is currently in the works and that is going to, to happen, uh, thankfully, thanks to the College of Arts and Sciences. And we have a pretty good and diligent and hardworking working group from CMLL, myself and and the Texas Tech Health Science Center. So we're pretty excited about this opportunity. We'll be one, we won't be, we won't be the only one in our R1 HSIs without an institute or center for our students. So we'll now join the ranks of other our peer institutions. So we're excited. Uh, like I said, uh, the minor is an 18 hour minor and we are enrolling students now. Uh, I'll be offering a course, uh, the introductory course in the spring. And yeah, I think that's great. Thank you, Dr. Lavadio. I think you started cutting out a little bit, but I think what we heard was that um, you'll start offering some courses in the spring. Um, that's an introductory course. Is that correct? Yes, that's that's where I left off. Thank you, Jade. Awesome. All right. Next, we'll have uh, Shruti Nelson with the Dream Resource Center. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Jade said, my name is Shruti Nelson. I'm excited to be here this afternoon um, and share a little bit. Um, I serve as assistant director for the Dream Resource Center. Um, and as Brandon mentioned earlier, I also work with first generation transition mentoring programs. I'll specifically work in, or talking about the Dream Resource Center um, this afternoon. So um, the, the or DRC you may hear um, on campus was um, created a few years back. Um, in response to um, the, the fact that there are an increasing number of students um, 
uh, in the city of Texas um, and nationally, really, um, who would be considered um, dreamers or undocumented. And so to kind of step back a little bit, um, who is a dreamer, right? So um, a dreamer is a student who is either has um, deferred action for childhood arrival or DACA status, um, or they are um, without documentation. And so that's, that's the dreamer category. We also work with students um, or maybe family members um, might not have documentation, but they do. Um, all that to say, um, we want to support these students in the best ways possible. Um, being sensitive to the needs of this population is really important because um, this is a population that, um, as many of you know, um, there's a lot of different factors that go into them having, having this story, right, and having this, this piece to share. And so um, we're excited to offer any types of services that we can um, to these students holistically. Um, some of the major kind of the, the main things that we offer um, we do have um, kind of mental health, um, financial help, um, those kinds of services for students. So we'll have students reach out to us that maybe need help getting um, financial aid. And we're, we're lucky that in the state of Texas, we have a specific um, application, um, the TESPA, the Te Texas Application for Student um, Financial Aid that they can do. So we'll get a lot of outreach from prospective students. We also just want to know, you know, what do I indicate when I'm applying? Um, and so that's, it's nice that we're able to offer that. We offer, um, free legal consultations. So um, if a student has to apply for the DACA program, um, there is a lot of paperwork. And so we're lucky enough to partner actually with the School of Law um, and the, uh, with our office. Um, and they are overseen by um, Dr. David Strange, who um, is an attorney in town and also a professor in the School of Law. Um, and so they, they meet with him in conjunction with a few legal interns um, and advise students. So it's, it's great that we're able to offer that for free um, to students because that's, that's a pretty hefty fee. And also these legal interns and, and um, David uh, know exactly how to fill that paperwork out. So it avoids that back and forth. So that's a really great service. Um, you know, please share that with your students. If you do ever have students that are, um, you know, um, have, have DACA status for sure. Um, the other piece we have, um, we do a lot of education and outreach. Um, we'll actually be hosting our um, first uh, Dream Ally training in about a week. So um, I'm going to ask Brandon to pop. Yep, he already did um, that form in. So if y'all are interested, maybe some of the words I said didn't make sense to you or um, you want to hear more about this population, um, we really review what sort of different immigration statuses are in more depth about what I just talked about with um, students who are dreamers. And then we really focus in on the best practices um, in supporting dreamers. So how do you have that conversation if a student comes to you and um, shares their story? Um, how do you work with, um, you know, to, to perhaps break some of those barriers in your own departments or programs that you might be seeing um, for the success of our, our dreamer population. So, um, so we'll be excited to see you at our training for sure. And then the last piece is um, the Dream Advisory Council. Um, so we, it's a group of campus faculty and staff and community partners um, and a few student representatives as well. Um, so we come together and, and brainstorm different ways in which we can best support, um, again, our, our dreamer population. So um, if anyone is interested by, um, you know, serving our, our dreamer students, um, or students with mixed family status, feel free to email me. I'm happy to kind of share more about the council um, or even our upcoming ally trainings with you. Awesome, thank you, Shruti. And last, but certainly not least, um, Timon, if you can go ahead. All right, thank you, Jade. Um, my name is Timon Thomas. I am the program coordinator at MentorTech. Uh, MentorTech is a service that we offer here at Texas State where we provide mentorship for students, and we refer to our students as protégés. So in case you hear that word and you're wondering, what does that mean in this case? It means that we're, you, that's your mentee. Um, the program has been around for over 20 years, so we've been serving for quite some time. Well, almost 20 years, I should say. We're celebrating 20 years next year, so we're pretty excited to be doing that very soon. Um, the program was named after Laura Cavarisos, and um, he was our first undergrad president to serve um, Texas Tech University. And also we have Ophelia um, Paul Malone, who was the first African-American undergrad student here at Texas Tech. Um, initially the program served primarily black and brown communities, but now the program has evolved to serve a really diverse um, community of students. Um, we serve students who are marginalized or um, 
just don't have a, a, a place where they can feel at home in, to some degree. So we, we try to reach out to them as much as possible and serve them as best as we can. Um, the program has been participating or doing, putting on activities that um, help to, to break cultural barriers and that are culturally relevant. So we try to provide activities that help people understand the cultures of other people that we meet on campus um, it, with regard to food and nutrition, um, how cultures interpret the use of money and even how they interpret scholarships and all these things. Um, those are things that we may not think about on a daily basis, but um, it is definitely something that we should have a better understanding of. And that's what we, we aim to do every day. We also um, provide sessions where students can be active and actively engaged in civil activities or civic activities, sorry. And they can engage in whatever discussions or topics that are um, relevant to them. So we encourage that kind of engagement. We also provide um, training for our mentors. We usually refer to them as roundtables, where you know the mentors can they themselves improve and become better individuals, so that they're more effective as mentors um, by helping to understand themselves, helping to understand identity biases that we may have in terms of appearance, dress, and other things that we may have uh, preconceived notions that we may have about people. We try to educate people on those issues so that you're better able to reach out to people and to mentor or, or speak to them and help them along their journey. Um, one of the ways that we think uh, Rawls can really partner with us is by providing um, information to your faculty, staff, and other graduate students that you may have um, that might be interested in being mentors. And I, I want to say here that being a mentor in this program doesn't mean that you have a 10 hour commitment or anything like that. It is very flexible. Um, I, I spoke to someone this week who said that she loved being a mentor because it literally only took her a couple minutes at times because it's just a matter of establishing a relationship with your protege as to what they require from you. And you just give them what they need in order to be successful. So um, I really want to hold in on that point that it is not um, very, very demanding as it may sound. So we really welcome you on board and we hope that the Rawls um, College would partner with us in order to provide more mentor options for our students. Thank you for that. Um, I know some of you mentioned um, some of your programs have, are new. Others have been around um, for quite some time. So talk to us a little bit about how maybe your programs and services have shifted, especially for some of us that may have been at tech for a long time. Um, what has have been those shifts and why have those shifts uh, shifts happen? And um, how was the program different than maybe when the, it first started? And so um, we'll go ahead and we'll start off with Brandon first. Thank you for that question. You know, what comes to mind initially with first generation transition and mentoring programs is the peer mentorship components. So over the last several years, you know, we were serving first year students and second year students. Well, you know, look at the literature, look at the research. There are so many support services that start at the beginning and then there's a drop off. How are we serving our juniors? How are we serving our seniors? How are we serving our graduate students? So really one of the things that um, FGTMP is looking at is how we expand to serve all students. And so, as I mentioned before, Specifically with first generation um, or FGTMP, um, you know, you know, we we. Oh goodness, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I lost like it just disappeared. Um, what we did was we expanded to serve our our first generation undergraduate students. You know, looking at 25 percent population, over 8,000 students. You know, how do we create this broad net of telling people we exist, telling people we've already existed, um, but then also now scaling out, scaling out that we do support juniors, do support seniors. Something more topical today that Shruti and I are discussing is how are we defining graduate students? How are that our first generation, right? And how are we letting graduate students know that despite being first gen in your undergrad, you're still first gen and you're, you're still navigating this system and this experience that you're not familiar with. And so we're having those dialogues today to create pathways for these students to take advantage of the programs we have to offer and to, to shift in that way. 
Thank you, Brandon. Um, John, I know uh, McNair has been on campus. Uh, we weren't able to get funding, but coming back, what have been some of the things um, that you've been able to do and shift with the McNair um, Explorers as well as the McNair Scholars Program? Well, I think one of the big ones is we created the McNair Explorers Program. And so our program is a two-year program. We typically recruit um, in the spring of the sophomore year, and then they start um, in the fall of their junior year, and it's two years. Hopefully, you know, they graduate and move on, which has um, been great. But we are trying to create like a pipeline, plus working with True and Sizer, we recognize that there are a lot of first years and sophomores who are interested, but don't really know where to start. And so we've created the McNair Explorers program and we work with um, the Center for Transformative Undergraduate Experiences on campus with that as well. Um, and that, what that does is we recruit first years and sophomores. It's currently a one-year program where we introduce tons of, you know, what research is, what grad school is, all your different options on campus. Um, and then at the end, they're given preference to go into McNair, but if some folks choose not to, or maybe it's not like the best fit, like they want to go to medical school or things of that sort, we help land them in the other programs on campus that, that can serve their needs. And so that's a big thing that we've done. So now that we're serving, much like Brandon, he was only serving the first two years and not the last two. We were serving the last two, but not the first two. So we've kind of just, we're now all four years, we have something for that. Um, We've also noticed some of our explorers, they finish after one year, but they're not quite ready for prime time. And so they have requested like to stay in the program a second year. And so um, we are looking at developing a second year um, peer mentorship um, program for those explorers that are not quite ready to, to take on, um, uh, you know, full, a full research project on their own. So we're looking at developing that over the next year. I think another thing is just um, we've really pushed in the past past little while is just networking is to get the students to really kind of go beyond themselves especially post covid or i guess we're still in covid but you know the 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 zoom the zoom event of the students being able to access graduate schools um, access uh, other labs all through zoom like i mean a majority of our graduate schools are doing zoom virtual events. And so our students have been able to interact with dozens of more grad schools than they would normally, or maybe they would only be able to interact with them if we went to an in-person conference and went to a grad school fair or something. Now there's stuff going on all the time that, that um, I can forward to our students. So that's something that we've really pushed a lot more is um, our, our Texas Tech students, a lot of them like to stay in Texas for grad school. And so getting them to to explore other schools and other states that may have different resources or may actually be a better fit for the type of research they want to do um, to kind of, that's really been something that we've been working on. Thank you. Um, Esther, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the shifts and changes from the Chicana Ch uh, Latina working group? Um, so since we started, we kind of, uh, it, with with the pandemic, it's been a little crazy, um, especially meeting virtually. A lot of our funding was for meeting in person, providing that lunch, providing snacks for it was like a three hour work, um, three hour work slot that you had at the end of the day once a month. And, and so we had built the pro the working group around that. Um, so we've had to like scale back and do things virtually, um, which. I am focusing on uh, since we've been back on campus is being more uh, serving to our students. Like, what, how can I collaborate with other entities on campus uh, to provide this um, mentoring, peer mentoring? Because I, I believe a lot in peer mentoring. Um, how can I provide others? How can you know we all work together? How can I uh, empower others? Um, and again, like just provide that um, space for Chicanas, Latinas, and whoever needs that space um, to feel comfortable and welcome. Um, some ideas that, you know, I've, I've, I've thought of, especially with a lot of um, people on social media are, are, um, are promoting a lot of um, master programs. Like I, growing up, even now, it's been hard um, not 
having that space for myself um, or being around others who in academia, I mean, um, that maybe might have the same or similar experiences that I do that look like me that, um, you know, just having that area where I can just go. And so I want to provide that for other people. That, so instead of just focusing on research and, 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 and just talking and I'm trying to like, it's a little bit, I guess the change you would say is, is being more fluid to be, to be able to, to fit in, and however, our, our respective uh, departments and colleges, our students, our faculty, our staff, our community members can feel like they can be a part of Texas Tech and the working group. And how can we provide that serviness to them? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lavadio, if you can talk a little bit about um, some maybe of the shifts and changes from an, ac from an academic program that you have experienced, and you mentioned, you know, the, the program shifting over um, to a different college, um, but where has, have the changes come from and where do you see them going? Uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Jade. Um, so, you know, even though we're relatively new, we have been uh, relatively accommodating to what the needs are of our students, and that's one of the reasons why we are moving from university studies to College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, as I mentioned, University Studies has been absolutely phenomenal in housing us and, and, and trying to recruit students, which they have. Um, and they do an exceptional job when it comes to online programs and online degrees and minors. And with the, with the minor, when we developed the curriculum for it, <clears throat> one of the other major principles that we had attached to it was that it would give our students the opportunity to meet Latina Latino faculty on campus. So it was very important for us to have as many face-to-face -face courses available. So when arts and sciences say, we know we can, we can provide that, that space and those, and those resources for you. Um, and then of course, in conjunction that we also had developed a second, uh, uh, the working group at the time had developed a second objective of creating a center. And that evolved with in conjunction with CMLL and the working group there with Latin American studies that it evolved into the institute that I mentioned in my introduction, which uh, we're, we're very excited about. Um, so that's how we kind of changed because we've heard from students, whether from a, from an anecdotal point of view of them saying like, you know, I wish we had more classes about our history, about our culture, and we just don't have them. Do we have classes that, that are that have themes or topics that focus on Latinos? Absolutely. But a lot of times they're much broader. A lot of times they're not necessarily courses that students feel they can identify with until they can take a, a, a Mexican American Latino studies uh, a course that's interdisciplinary where they can learn about history, culture, art, music, and so forth. Uh, so those have been very successful. And every time we've offered it, we've been able to grow the enrollment there. So we know that with the numbers even, uh, when we offer it, they come. So that's one of the changes we've made. One of the other changes and shifts we made is try to make it as, as accessible as accessible uh, as possible. Uh, we don't want to exclude our, our, especially our engineering students, uh, but many of our STEM students don't have a lot of flexibility in their, in their course requirements, but we're trying our best to reach out to their departments and see how we can um, uh, have their students take our classes. And one way we did that is that our introductory course, the, the MALS 2300, is, also satisfies the multicultural core requirement for arts and sciences. So that was one way that we tried, we shifted, we tried to change so that, you know, if, if anything, they can at least take that one class and they can kill two birds with one stone, their multicultural requirement and obviously their own curiosity or own uh, 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 desire to take a class like that. So, um, so yeah, so I was gonna say, we're, 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 we're constantly moving. We're in a, in a, in a, in a stage of transition right now. Um, we're excited and we hope that it'll, it'll grow and we will be uh, making our presence known pretty soon. So yeah, we'll, we'll be making an announcement here soon so everybody knows like, where we're gonna be located. I don't wanna say one way or the other because that hasn't been established yet. Um, but I do wanna say that this will be coming online very, very soon. Thank you, Dr. Lavario. We have the inside scoop here, so. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, Timon, with a, a program like Mentor Tech being around for 19 years, I'm sure there's been shifts and changes. 
Um, talk to us a little bit about, and I know you're also newer uh, to your role, uh, so if you need Brandon to step in a little bit, but talk to us a little bit about some of the shifts um, that Mentor Tech has seen and potential upcoming um, new things that you envision for the program. Okay, thank you, Jay. Um, well, the fact that I've only been here for three weeks, um, <laughs> I would have to rely on Brandon to help me out here. But what I would say is that um, initially the program served basically brown and black um, students here at Texas Tech. So we've shifted from that and we've been, become more inclusive. Um, and as I said earlier, we do serve a more diverse community. We, do, we serve the, man, the marginalized community especially. So um, so that has been one of the shifts that we've noticed because we, we, we realize the importance of adapting to the time. Um, and as I said, we're going to be celebrating 20 years. So we've been around for quite some time. So we do need to change at some point. And we have been doing that. Um, what we envision for this program is that, especially with the new staff and so that we've been getting, is that we are even more engaged in providing what the students need by getting their input and getting their feedback as to how the program affects them, um, what ways we can even reach out to them even more than we have been before. So a lot of what we're doing now is getting feedback from the students. That is very important for us. And also feedback from the mentors. Um, some of the mentors we had said that, um, you know, the challenge of COVID was something that they've never experienced before. And they've had to find new ways of um, reaching out to students and engaging them. And also, um, you know, there's a lot of mental issues and stuff that come along with um, the challenges we've had with COVID. And the round tables that we've had and all these other events that we've had so far has helped to better prepare our mentors for helping students when they need that kind of help. So um, we are very excited about those changes. I would pass it on to Brandon to just add some more based on his um, years of experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I just saw Dr. Cook's comment in the chat. And so I did drop some need areas so that we can support our amazing program participants in mentor tech. Um, but one of the, the most kind of prevalent pieces that I did want to acknowledge is just with the pandemic, you know, I think across the nation, across, across the world, we realized as, as academia, we were not prepared for this remote experience and this virtual learning experience. And that really called into question mentor tech's ability to pivot still providing people the opportunity to build these mentor relationships because ultimately we wanted to serve the students the students were going back home the students were navigating you know on campus housing sustainable wi-fi access to technology and so on our end we had to decide okay we're gonna mentor we know that's gonna happen how and when and where and so really being flexible having the ability to come together and develop systems that empowered our mentors to connect virtually using cell phones, using other means as opposed to in-person was really, really helpful at the time this past year. Um, and so we're really grateful for that. And then um, just, you know, having great partners such as Dr. Cook and uh, I see Dr. Lumpkin on the call, just helping us spread the word and uh, letting faculty know that this is something they can do for their, for their students and for students in their academic pathways. Like this is why we exist to help mentor your students and, and help them be successful. Thank you. Um, I also know uh, we'll actually be sending a list um, to all of the deans of faculty and staff that serve as mentors. Um, our hope is that our deans could send notes along the way. I know one of the biggest thing with our mentors is feeling appreciated, feeling valued. And so for us, we appreciate and value our mentors tremendously. The program could not exist without them, but also being in, being able to communicate that to your own colleges and your administration, knowing that um, you're doing this when you don't have to, right? Um, and so that's something that we'll be actually implementing um, this year. And it was um, one of the deans uh, mentioned it as I was having a meeting. They're like, well, send me the list because I'll send them a note. And I was like, you know what? We're going to do this with all the deans. Um, so that is something that will be coming out and hopefully being able to garner more um, support from faculty and staff to join to be a mentor. Um, our next question, you know, really focusing on after the last uh, session with Hispanic Serving Institution Week, a lot of conversations around, you know, what does the serving part of Hispanic serving institutions mean? So 
Um, what does culturally relevant practices mean to you? And how does your program or service provide culturally relevant practices? And uh, we'll, I'd like to start off with uh, Shruti. Thank you, Jade. That's an excellent question. Um, and the, the, the really great part about um, the Dream Resource Center is that one of our main goals is to educate um, and advocate for our dreamer students. And um, something that um, comes out of this education piece is being able to have these dialogues and conversations about um, the myths and the assumptions that um, people hold about, um, you know, what DACA means, what someone who is undocumented, um, you know, means, who, what they look like, who they, where they're coming from. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a exciting is probably not the word, but it's an exciting part of my role is to be able to kind of do that. And as we mentioned the ally training earlier, um, the, that does specifically that, right? It talks through, um, you know, there are so many ways in which an individual can become um, undocumented here in the United States. And um, a lot of times there are pieces, um, and unfortunately this is a population where um, the, uh, the national climate um, has a huge effect on our students. Um, and so um, so there are just folks that are going to be hearing different things. Maybe some of you on this call, you know, you might be reading the news and then hearing kind of a specific narrative or a story. Um, and so how are we debunking those those pieces um, through through our ally training um, and, and on campus as well. Another kind of piece of that um, is for our students. So um, last year, you know, I started about a little bit over a year ago. Um, and as we know, it was kind of in the middle of this, um, this, this election cycle. And, um, you know, there were some decisions at stake for our, our Dreamer students. Um, and many of you probably have seen um, recently in the news, there's just been different decisions made by judges on the DACA, um, the, the DACA application. And so our students wanted to, you know, just have, you know, it might seem like they needed all of these pieces and they needed a lot, but what they needed the most was mental kind of support, mental health and, and well-being support. Um, and so we were actually able to partner with the um, counseling center um, and just spend an hour talking to um, our, our dreamers and, and students with mixed family status about, um, you know, how they were feeling and how they could take care of themselves in the weeks leading up to that, that cycle, right? So um, that was really, really relevant for, for those students. And so I think it's really shifting what these students need with, um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, what's going on, I think more than a lot of our other populations um, on the national level um, as well. And then um, the last piece I want to mention too is, um, we focus also a lot on um, this, this, this financial aid and, and that piece um, that is, again, coming thinking about the students and where they're going to be coming from. Many of our students have been Texas residents for, for many, many years. And so how are they still able to get that financial support? And so, um, again, in a few weeks, we'll be doing a FAFSA and TASFA workshop for these students um, in conjunction with first generation transition mentoring programs um, so that these students don't feel like, hey, I'm the only one here. It's going to be obvious that I am um, a, a dreamer, right? But we're going to work with all first gen students because financial aid is, of course, something that's really important. So, um, so yeah, I think our, our program really, really serves to um, identify what these students need are um, I think within the context of what's happening on a, on a more national level. Shruti, can you also speak to, um, I know you all have done work across the state and the importance in a culturally relevant practice of having statewide coalition with other Dream Resource Centers. Um, so, so much like Brandon was giving me some, some props earlier, um, I'm really going to, um, you know, give, give Brandon a lot of credit on this, but we are um, really excited that we've been able to um, uh, have actually an intern through um, one of our, our not, um, statewide uh, um, professional organizations, um, and he's actually at the University of North Texas has been working with us um, to gather some, some research and data on how, as Jade mentioned, we can develop this sort of um, consortium or, or group um, of institutions across the state. Um, this is really important because a lot of, I mentioned the education piece, but a lot of the other work that we do is also advocacy, right? Um, and so um, going back to this piece of, 
of being mindful of what our students' needs are, if we're able to build that, that sort of coalition and work together um, across the state, see what best practices are already happening, but also be able to convene together and discuss how can we work together. Maybe um, we have this really great practice and you know, um, UT Austin um, does something a little bit differently or they have a more focused approach. How are we kind of coming together um, creating and also maybe eventually, you know, the goal really is to have deliverables or tangibles to be able to advocate on a more statewide level for, for these services, but, you know, baby steps to getting there, but it's really having these, these open conversations and um, working not only with other institutions, but also college access organizations um, and more community-based organizations. So we're in West Texas um, and um, there is, you know, I think, just a little bit of the less of that, but um, you know, when you go kind of to San Antonio, Austin, Houston, you're going to see some more of these organizations too. So how can we work to also, um, and really students are of course at the core of this. And, and so how can we kind of take that on an elevated um, level? So Brenda, if there's anything I missed in that consortium, please feel free to add. Great, nice job. Um, next, Lindsay, if you could talk a little bit about TRIO Student Support Services and some of the culturally relevant advising practices um, that you all provide. Absolutely. So I think something um, as I've been advising over the last eight or nine months, something I've noticed, um, there was definitely a difference in students' reaction and perceptions of the COVID pandemic when everything shifted online. And there were students that I met with that thought that was the most fabulous thing ever because their schedule was so much more well-organized and this is the greatest thing and can it stay like this? And then there were students that thought it was the worst thing ever because that's not their learning style and you know they need help and we're struggling. And I use that as just a very small example about how our perceptions are so different depending on your background, your experiences, your learning style, your interests. I mean, literally so many things that can affect the way we perceive the world. And something that I love about TRIO in particular is our small cohort and our um, advising sessions that we get to have with them one-on-one -on -one where we're, we're getting to know our students at that level. We're, we're, understanding their backgrounds, asking them questions, they're opening up to us about these experiences. And I think that that's really important because it just creates an environment that is curious, open to discussion, open to questions, open to student input, and, um, you know, making changes as needed, because there's, I think, just being aware of systemic obstacles that they could be facing, um, unconscious bias that could be happening across campus or in the community within their own families sometimes. Um, first generation students struggle with um, some things that are happening within their own families and that can be really hard for people to navigate. And so something that I really, I think is special about TRIO SSS is working with students one-on-one -on -one to understand those perspectives and backgrounds, getting feedback from them on that, but then also coaching them and advising them on how to respond to those situations, how to navigate when those kinds of things are happening to them across campus. Great, thank you, Lindsay. Um, if I could have Esther, I know you mentioned earlier about um, you know, having an affinity space for Latinas and Chicanas. Can you talk a little bit more about some of those culturally relevant practices of your working group that you, you've been able to incorporate and why that's important? Um, well, I guess I just, uh, I want to start off by saying, you know, that to me, culturally relevant practices means that we're meeting the needs of our students, um, taking into account their emotional, financial, physical well-being, as well as meet them at their level intellectually and promoting their culture and helping them to maneuver. maneuver um, college without making them feel like they have to leave their identity behind uh, or be ashamed of who they are. And so our space provides um, that space uh, where they can just be who they are, ask questions if they need to. Um, originally, when it was uh, first brought to me, it was for uh, grad students, faculty, and staff. 
Um, but we had uh, interest from some community members and then we had some members leave to work other places. So it kind of, um, I want it to be this way, but uh, to grow and to be, to acknowledge people from other places um, because that's the space that they need to be in. Um, it is inclu inclusive. We do. That's why we have that uh, Chicana X, Latina X, because we want it to be inclusive of, of other identities. Um, and just be that space, like I said, that fluid space where however you need me or our space to fit into your life, um, whatever that means to you, that um, I think um, that's where that... Um, culturally relevant practices because um, sometimes we don't know what we need um, or maybe it's in, in a different form than what other people might think. Um, and so, however, and, and I come from, you know, I'm from the library. So I come from this mind space where I can, I'm going to help you. However, I need to help you. I'll find a way to help you. <laughs> um, and so that in within that you know, I, I do take in consideration where you come from. Do you speak, you know, do you need help with something? You know, are you a heritage speaker? Do you, what is it that you need as a faculty member, as a fellow colleague, as, you know, um, things that I wish I had in, in, in my life, um, I want to give to others. And, and I'm happy to, to be able to have the space to provide it for them. I hope that there, answers the question. Absolutely. Um, there is a question in the chat um, Dr. Cook is, you know, mentioning that there's lots of conversations that they've had in terms of word choice and definitions. Um, what is the difference between Chicana, Latina, Chicanex, Latinx? So, to not, Chicana, <laughs> it's like opening Pandora, Pandora's box. No. Um, so, Chicana, Chicano uh, comes from... Uh, there's a lot, the long history behind it with the Chicano movement. Um, and so before people used to associate that word with uh, the Chicano movement from California, um, but really how we bring it to our space is a person of Mexican American descent or Mexican descent or is Mexican. And, um, and then Latino, the American, uh, Latin American, um, and there's um, like a, there's there's a lot behind those terms. Uh, we're not labeling anybody. We accept whatever labels. Like I I I choose to go by either one: Chicana, Latina, Tejana, uh, however Hispanic, Mexican American. I'm all of those. I, I check all. Um, so I guess the distinction between Latina, Chicana, Chicana is mainly Mexican American, Mexican descent. And Latina would be a more broader term used. Great, thank you. Um, Corey Hamilton, if you could talk a little bit about how your program provides um, culturally responsive or relevant practices. Absolutely. Uh, I think from, from the perspective of um, the intercultural engagement uh, and education, um, you know, in providing cultural heritage month events and celebrations, um, we know that representation matters on campus. And so um, being, um, you know, over 25% students um, that are, that identify as Hispanic or Latinx, um, having, having events for people to participate in um, provides a space of feeling like this is their community, um, that they are a part of the campus and have um, their values uh, matter. And so for anybody that got to participate uh, two weeks ago in our El Grito present, um, uh, uh, event um, in Urbanovsky Park. We had uh, over 400 people coming to celebrate um, the different uh, Latinx countries uh, that are represented here on campus, um, to see the procession of flags, um, to partner with community partners like um, Ballet Folklorico from Lubbock High School, um, to see the, the West Texas culture um, and the Latinx culture and the student culture all come together in a space of celebration um, I know Jade and I were there until almost 10 o'clock at night and the students were just dancing away in the park. Um, traditional dances, circle dances. Um, it was amazing to see. Um, and being able to provide opportunities like that, that are student-led, student-planned, 
um, and then students, you know, participated, uh, really provides a space uh, for this community to be something where folks can feel uh, like they really are valued in the community. Uh, and for Raider Education, uh, we really try uh, to focus on that education piece, um, kind of around what Esther is talking about, um, how to have conversations about distinctions and definitions um, in a brave space where students can bring their experience, uh, talk about their background, um, and then be open-minded to hearing other perspectives. And so um, when we talk about things like anti-racism on campus, allyship on campus, um, understanding and creating inclusive cultural spaces, um, it's, it's tough topics uh, for a lot of folks to, to dive into that conversation. Um, but afterwards, we often hear about like, you know, I had never thought about it from that perspective. And I'm going to really make an intention to um, see this space in a different way or to take some of my time each week or each month um, to really look for opportunities to change what I'm doing. And we found some great ways to have those conversations um, with faculty, staff, and students all together, um, as well as in student spaces. And so we, we just kind of look forward to, to getting to do more of that. Um, but giving people that language to talk about it um, is so important. Um, and so when they have a common language to talk about inclusive leadership, I've heard a couple of people mention things like bias, um, responding to microaggressions. When people have that language, um, then it opens up the conversations that they're able to have about um, cultural differences, cultural similarities, uh, and being a part of creating a community. So absolutely. Corey, can you speak to a little bit about how you are building up the peer-to-peer -peer education and why that's important? Absolutely. Um, over this first year that Raider Education was around, um, we really were um, wanting to get the word out that we existed. And we really were set to launch right after uh, spring break uh, of 2020, which everybody knows when spring break of 2020 got extended by a week and then nobody came back. Um, so we did a quick shift to a lot of virtual programming, um, which was met very well. I see a lot of folks in the call that have um, had Raider Education come into their classrooms, uh, come into their um, residence halls, into their student staff programs um, to do uh, some kind of a, a training or workshop. And then also I see some folks that have been doing um, series of events with us. And so um, for us this year, we really wanted to shift into, especially for the student facing piece, um, to be peer led. And our peer educators and our student staff um, have the ability to, to take their experience um, and really come up with creative activities and conversations um, to have with one another. Uh, we, spend, uh, we spend time talking about topics and doing research on topics, reading um, new research studies that are coming out, new, new books, um, things like that, and incorporating that into what we do. Um, but the interesting thing about Raider Education is um, it's not what people expect when you think of diversity training. Um, we really come into a space um, with the idea of um, it's not going to be a lecture. Uh, it's going to be activity-based, it's going to be conversation-based, and it's going to be based on the experience that students, staff, and faculty bring to it, um, because our experience is the empirical evidence, um, and our experience makes us um, somewhat experts uh, to talk about what we do and what we've done. And so training peer educators and having you know, strong peer educators, um, kind of like having peer mentorship programs, um, just gives us the ability to, to reach students um, at their level even more effectively. And I have to also say, um, we've done some programs um, with uh, folks like the, the law school where we did like learning lunches. And we've been in conversations with Rawls about doing some learning lunches in the spring um, where deans, faculty, staff, and students, graduate and undergraduate, can come together. And it's really powerful to have um, a facilitated conversation where Raider Education can come in just kind of give some definitions and then open the conversation up. And for students to hear what faculty and deans experience about their own culture, their own identities, um, their own biases, uh, it makes it uh, very real uh, for everyone. And for the opposite is true too, for students to be able to share and for faculty and staff um, and leadership to hear about experiences. Um, there have been some great conversations and then some real meaningful um, changes that have happened on campus within colleges and within programs um, to kind of move forward in being supportive of students, um, as well as diverse staff and faculty too. Thank you, Corey. Um, I 
want to remind folks, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat. We do have about 10 minutes, or if you want to ask, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I can uh, scroll the screen. Um, but um, we'll also um, talk about, um, you know, with Texas Tech being a Hispanic serving institution, um, what do you hope for the future of Texas Tech as an HSI and beyond? And I'll go ahead and start us off with uh, Dr. Lovadio. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I think um, we're on the right trajectory. I mean, again, we're, I think we have to give ourselves some sort of uh, uh, credit, I guess, in the sense that we just became HSI in 2019, give or take. So, you know, we have a lot to catch up on, especially when it comes to our our R1 HSI peer institutions, but I think that with the involvement of the Office of DEI, the Office of the President, and, and a number of our faculty and student organizations are really coming together to really see what can they do to, to make Texas Tech a, a proud HSI institution. And that's what one of the things that I've noticed uh, in the in in the past few years is just that you know once you once the call went out it seems like everybody has responded especially our students which I'm very very proud of they really come together to say what can we do even those that are seniors and are not going to be able to experience or take advantage of the services or programs or events that they're trying to organize they still want to be they still want to be involved in organizing and I think that's one testament to how I'm seeing Texas Tech moving in, in, in a positive direction towards SSI. And I think that, HSI, excuse me. And I think that, you know, with, 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 with programs with our ethnic studies, with the, with, you know, the, the, more, the more recent, the Black Cultural Center, uh, the Institute for Latino Studies, I think all those are, are really relevant and, and pertinent to Texas Tech moving in the right direction. So, yeah, I think, we have, I think we're on a good path. Uh, I just think we should keep going and, and, not, and not lose steam. Thank you, Dr. Lavadio. Uh, Brandon, if you could give some of your comments of um, what you hope for the future for tech as an HSI and beyond. Absolutely. So, you know, in my perspective, I think that, you know, my vision, my vision for the future as an HSI institution is seeing how we connect all the puzzle pieces, you know, um, how we're working together, not in silos, how we're collaborating, how faculty, staff, and students are working together to elevate our Latinx and Hispanic student stories. You know, I, I'm, 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 the reality of the fact is we need to have the data, we need to have the numbers, we need to have that progression, right? But just not forgetting that these students are people, you know, they're not just a demographic, they're not just a checkbox. We need to maintain their humanity as we move forward and really think not just, you know, I'm serving the student by building another program, I'm serving the student by building another initiative. How are we investing in our faculty? How are we representing our student communities through leadership, through faculty, um, and through um, administrators? And how are we telling those stories, I think is going to be pivotal to the success of these students. When we talk about transition and belonging and wellness, you know, it, all of those things coalesce into this, um, you know, situation where that impacts their connection to campus and their ability to persist and to trust us as faculty and staff. If our students don't trust us, we're not going to get their buy-in and they're not going to lean into their academic experience. So how are we doing those things in the future? You know, we have all this opportunity to come together and and um, have those interesting conversations and of course, keeping the students at the core. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Monica Delgado, I see that you have a question. I actually um, appreciate being able to be here and learning more about it. As a Texas Tech alumni and a community advocate, it's really important for me to know what exactly is taking place at Texas Tech with it growing as much as it's grown. I know that you talk about mentor programs and things of that nature. I do wanna make sure that we I know, I guess I heard that you're looking at campus for those mentors and things. And I'm just wanting to also say that us alumni that are out in the community would be happy to also mentor, um, give back to our community, um, our Texas Tech community. 
in whatever way possible that we can. It's important to, to know that what I fought for all those years that I went a long time ago when it was very difficult for me as a first generation student to know that the advancement that has gone on and taken place is, is great. We're not where we need to be, but we're in a much better position than we were all the years ago that I was there. And I do applaud all of y'all for speaking and, and having this presentation because it's very important. And I wish a lot of other people were hearing it because it's really great information. And I will talk about all you guys at all the meetings that I have coming up. But I just wanted to say thank you and just also let you know that there's people in the community that want to help as well. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate those comments. Um, I'll actually have Brandon talk about that because um, I don't think probably Timon knows uh, the conversations we've had around that exact topic. So Brandon, if you want to talk about um, the future of maybe mentorship and the things that we've talked about and conversations we've had. Absolutely. So as it stands right now, mentors, um, those that are invited to be mentors are faculty, staff, or graduate students within Texas Tech. Um, and so we really want to expand and have this conversation of how are we looping in our alumni networks? How are we looping in you know, business professionals in the public and private sector to mentor and guide our protégés? When we think of the transition from first year to second to third to fourth, you know, that pendulum swings on their understanding of the of the expectations and the experience in a college environment. And so having alumni work with our students is going to be critical. Um, we're always looking to collaborate, to partner and to pilot. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking at you, Monica, you're going to get an email from Jade and I, it's going to happen. And, and we're going to see what we can do this spring because we need to start now. And what better time than with eager and energetic collaborators such as yourself. You. Um, and I know um, we'll go ahead and um, Esther, if you could talk um, a little bit about um, what you hope for the future of Texas Tech as um, an HSI. Um, kind of just want to say ditto to what everybody was saying. Um, it's very important that, you know, uh, we recognize um, our Latinx, Hispanic students. Um, and their individual identities. Um, we forget sometimes that um, we all each have our own identities and uh, may not come from the same space or place, um, places as other people. We've, we all have our own stories, like uh, Brandon was saying. And um, I do hope that we remember to always continue these conversations, not only during um, Hispanic Heritage Month, but throughout the school year, throughout their college years. Um, and like Brandon, I want to reiterate what Brandon says to, to support our faculty and our staff and, and um, those who interact with our students, because um, sometimes a lot of us feel like we don't have that, that support um, to do the things that we would like to do to help support our students. Um, so I do see that as, as, as something that maybe we could strive to do better. Um, it, we're doing, and, and I'm learning a lot, um, because I'm, I'm a lead, um, uh, fellow. Um, and then I've also began, uh, doing more with the Office of Diversity. So, so it's great to have those opportunities, but, um, I do wish that, uh, we did had more opportunities for de professional development. How do we, um, how can we be more better at uh, conversing with others, collaborating with others on campus and, and continuing that process? Um, because I think we sometimes we want to do it and we talk about it and then it falls through, you know, through the holes. And, um, and we should always have that conversation going throughout um, to for forever, really. And we're here to support our students. Thank you for that, Esther. I know we are coming close to our time. I want to thank all of our panelists um, for spending uh, your time with us, for all of our attendees. Um, we really appreciate you listening. Um, if I could offer that, the conversations don't have to stop here. Um, we're always a collaborative spirit. Um, that is uh, probably something, um, having come in three years ago, is really important to me. This work cannot be done alone. It takes every single one of us at Texas Tech um, to constantly be learning, educating, and collaborating in order for us to move forward as a Hispanic serving institution, one of 16 that is also designated as a research one institution, which is a big deal. 
Um, so I hope that you all will reach out, um, refer your students. If you want to learn more, get involved. We can always do um, further sessions um, with you. Uh, I just did a session with housing on, um, you know, intentionally intentionally serving Latinx students specifically. And so um, we're always happy to do more. Um, and you all are, you know, what make uh, our institution great. And so we appreciate the partnership collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Cook, for having all of us on the panel. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, please join me in, in thanking the, um, the, the you know, nine folks who gave up 75 minutes out of your day to, to be here and to share all of this great information with, with us. I, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, I, I want to point out just really quickly that, you know, obviously we could not cover every single service that's offered by the Division of Diversity, Equity, and, and, and Inclusion. So, um, you know, be aware that if you go to their website, there's plenty of other services that are, are offered out there. Uh, the Office of LGBTQIA Education and Engagement, Military and Veteran Services, and so I want to also put in a, a, a plug um, for, for MVP, the Military and Veteran Programs Office. We're going to have a, a Donuts and Diversity during the week of um, Veterans Day uh, on the, the Tuesday preceding Veterans Day at 2 in the afternoon. And the um, new-ish director of, of that program, Sierra Mello Miles and her team, will be um, hopefully in Rawls in person, but we'll see, maybe in person, maybe virtually. Um, commemorating Veterans Day and also sharing with us the, the services that are provided by um, their office as well. So um, thank you again all for, for, for being here, for, for sharing your time with us. Um, we will make this recording available. So if you have folks who you know wish they could have been here but it didn't fit their schedule, we'll make sure that we get this posted on the um, DEI webpage and Rawls. So anyone who would like access can, can have it. And we're happy to share that with anyone else who um, might want to post it you know, elsewhere. Uh, for, for consumption. So thank you again. Have a great rest of the day. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you, Kirsten.